The single track staff is making more time to ride our bikes right now, and hopefully you are too. This week, we're resharing one of our favorite podcast episodes, and we'll be back next week with an all new show. Happy trails. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Single Tracks podcast. My name is Jeff, and today my guests are Pat White and Doug LaFaver. Pat is a longtime product manager for Kona Bicycles, and Doug, aka Dr. Dew, has been designing bikes for Kona for decades. Thanks for joining me, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. So, Pat. Whenever people talk about hardcore hardtails, the Kona Hanzo is invariably mentioned. Tell us a bit about the history of this bike. Well, I guess first off, the term hardcore is uh, it, it, not one of my favorite terms, but uh, I think for the sake of getting through this, I'm just going to have to deal with it. But uh, I do I do understand where you're coming from with that term hardcore. <laughs> I, I was told that you didn't like that term. That's funny, actually. So, yes, you confirmed <laughs> it. But it's a term everybody uses. People love it for whatever reason. So, yeah, yep. I guess we're going to have to deal with it. For sake of conversation, we'll we'll stick to it, and I'll just have to I'll just have to put up with it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think the best way to kind of talk about that would be to start with the beginning. Start at the beginning with the uh, the hardtails. I mean, we started out in '88 with what four models, and we didn't even I don't think we even called those cross country. Even though if you had to categorize those hardtails at that time, you would you know, by today's standards, call those cross country. They were just mountain bikes. Mm. And then um, I think right around the mid 1990s, we saw a need for a change in hardtails to better suit what people were doing. I mean, there was the shore riding was going off. If you went to the races and saw like the dual slalom events or even people riding stock trials and just the way people were mountain biking on just about everywhere, mm -hmm. there was just that we saw a need for a change and making a hardtail that was a bit different than what was being offered. And, and of course that led to stronger tubes, geometry that catered more to riding steep, aggressive terrain. Mm -hmm. And what were some other things? Oh, fork. I think another thing that drove that too, is that we saw a fork manufacturers starting to make longer forks and people were just throwing these on bikes mm. so they could ride this more aggressive, do this more aggressive riding. And, and I mean, that was good in a way that it slackened the front end, but it also, if you just put that on a bike that was designed for a shorter travel fork or a, a bike with a uh, designed for a shorter axle to crown, it slackened out the head too, but it also raised the bottom bracket height, which really wasn't doing any favors for what the intent was. And then also that put those longer forks put, um, and that more aggressive riding put a lot more strain on the frame. So that's where we always see those old videos of head tubes getting ripped off. So we saw a need to adjust geometry, use a more robust tubing, no matter what the material was, and uh, especially get that head tube area and other areas reinforced. That's where you start seeing gusseting on early models like the Shoot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was a big step in the mid-90s. We started offering those models like the Shoot. And I think it was about 2012, we did the first Hanzo model. and Again, that was a, another another big step in addressing or, or creating hardtails for more aggressive riding or, or hardcore, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. And that was that first Hanzo. So obviously that whole low, lower, slacker, longer thing, the sh really short chain stays. We got into what the 417 or maybe even shorter chain stays and uh, longer reach. We'll talk about that more. Well, I'm, I'm curious now to to know what what's what's wrong with the term hardcore hardtail what what do you think i mean it sounds like you feel like they're aggressive like what's what's maybe a better term for us to use when we're talking about these types of bikes i think it's just a personal thing hardcore can be defined defined you know different ways so aggressive but uh you know hardcore's fine i was just being difficult <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we all have our our terms like that like yeah, enduro and down country. And it is, is really hard to classify bikes and like sum it all up in one word and use it to describe like all these different bikes that different people are making, different brands, and everybody's got a slightly different take on it. And, uh, yeah, it can be tough. Yeah. And that, uh, those using those words like hardcore, aggressive are, you know, a big part of marketing too. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you track those, those customers? But yeah, like as I said earlier, that for the sake of conversation, the hardcore works fine for, for what we're talking about today. Yeah. So I would say 
to finish off the uh, the history of the Hanzo, you know, from 2012, that first Hanzo, we definitely, that is, is obviously further diversified because now we have like a Hanzo ESD. We have mm-hmm. Hanzo AL, Hanzo DL. We have aluminum. We have steel. We have the big Hanzos with the plus tires still. So it's it's become more than just one model. Well, yeah. Uh, my next question kind of speaks to this idea of, of how do you categorize these bikes and what do you call them? And so I'm, I'm curious to know, like, what's your personal opinion? Like, where is the cutoff between just a regular hardtail, you know, one that's meant for maybe cross country riding or, or like light duty trail versus one that's more hardcore? Is it something about the geometry, the, the construction of it? What is it that, that makes an aggressive hardtail? Oh, for sure. You hit it, Jeff. It's, uh, again, it depends on how you define hardcore. I mean, who is that rider and what exactly do they intend to do with the bike? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're heading to that aggressive hardcore riding, steeper, rougher terrain than what, what normally would have been before or relative to what other people are doing. So it's, it's, it's kind of a hard one to define, but you did hit it right. I mean, geometry, when I say frame design, not necessarily material, because we'll talk about that more, but um, specification, uh, you know, we're not with a, a, a hardcore hardtail, you know, weight's not that much of a consideration. It's more like the durability and mm-hmm. the power in the case of stuff like the brakes, uh, the amount of travel in the fork, that kind of thing. So um, for sure, frame design, part specification, and uh, I guess geometry is part of that frame design. Yeah, and it seems like it's kind of shifted as well, I guess, with a lot of things in mountain biking. Whereas, you know, a few years ago when people first started using the term hardcore hardtail, people would talk about bikes with like 120 millimeters of of suspension. And then today, that's kind of like the XC trail territory. And so, yeah, we've kind of had to shift our expectations even about like what what is aggressive. And it's, it's all kind of relative uh, which which seems interesting. You brought up a good point there, your last point, and that is, you know, when uh, how do you define the hardcore rider? And, you know, Pat uh, is responsible for a lot of bikes that come under the Kona umbrella, but the one thing that's interesting is, you know, the XC race bike now is nothing like the old XC race bike. You know, they're all pushing towards a, a more extreme geometry, slackening out the front end. So, I think if you look at the Hanzo, like it really takes it a little bit further, you know, and, Mm. and even if you look at, um, cross country hardtails, they're slacker and more durable than they used to be. So it's all sort of trending in that direction. And you look at the Hanzo as kind of being the extreme Mm. part of that hardtail range. Yeah, for sure. Well, so are hardcore hardtails or aggressive hardtails, good for a certain type of riding? I mean, where would you place that? Is it like the trail, all mountain? And are there limits? Like, you know, we see some brands have like what they would call enduro or like long travel hardtails. Like, does that make sense in your mind? Or is there like more of a sweet spot for these more aggressive hardtails? You know, if you look at bikes like the Hanzo and then other bikes like, you know, a Kahuna or something like that, you know, that as I mentioned before, the geometry the, the, um, focus more on lightweight for, for climbing and all around riding where the concern is, you know, power and durability, Mm -hmm. um, just ability to tackle that more aggressive terrain. So obviously you wouldn't want, or you would prefer to have a bike like a Hanzo if you were doing some steep, rooty, aggressive, challenging technical terrain where, and going downhill where, you know, if you were going to be doing a long climb and maybe not so much, you're going to be more comfortable and better off on a bike like a Kahuna or a more cross country designed bike in terms of the weight of the bike, mm-hmm. the components and the geometry. You know, obviously taking a bike with a 63 degree head angle and climbing it on all day is not going to be as fun as, as something with a more, you know, in the area of 68, 69 degree head angle and, you know, vice versa. Obviously, if you're going to be doing aggressive shuttle runs that Hanzo is going to be a better tool for the job. You're going to have a better experience with a bike that's designed to ride that kind of terrain. Yeah. So Pat, I mean, is there a limit though? Like, would you, if someone said, Hey, is, is racing a hardtail in an enduro race? Like, is that a good idea? Do you think like 
there's there's a limit where you say this that's just too much and you need to go full suspension or do you think that the hardtail really is versatile enough that you can make it a, a bike for the most aggressive type of riding that's a great question. And it, uh, you know what, what comes to mind when someone asks a question like that, like you, especially, especially you say a race, you know, if you're intent in a enduro race, you know, granted that the, the race course is technical enough. If your intent is to do and have the best time or placing possible, then probably a full suspension bike is going to get you from point A to point B faster. Mm -hmm. However, some people will want to go to events and have a different kind of experience. And I think riding a hardtail aggressively versus a full suspension bike, you know, there's, there's just a different connection with how you're riding the terrain on a hardtail. Obviously most people can't slam through obstacles uh, as easily or as quickly as they could on a full suspension bike, but there's a, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's definitely a pleasure and experience of feeling that you get with riding a, a, a hardtail. And there's a kind of a reward too. Like, you know, man, I just did that really gnarly section <laughs> on hardtail and I looked awesome doing it. And maybe it wasn't as fast <laughs> as I would have been on a full suspension bike, but it's, it's a different experience. So I, as far as a limitation, I think that just depends on the person and what the, what they're looking for in the ride experience. For sure. Yeah. And that, that connection with the bike and with the trail, I think, yeah, that a lot of people can really identify with that. Doug, I'm curious to know how important frame material is when it comes to designing a hardtail. You know, it, it seems like compared to a, a full suspension bike that maybe frame material is more important, but maybe not. So fill us in on that. Like, how do you go about thinking about the frame materials used uh, when you're designing a hardtail? Certainly, if we look back uh, at some of the older bikes, frame material is really important, especially when we were riding back in the early 80s, pre-suspension, you know, aluminum was very unforgiving and uh, steel and titanium were kind of the materials of choice back then. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, like an extreme bike like the Hansa goes, we've basically built them out of steel, aluminum, carbon fiber. And even titanium, you know, if you were to really look at them and say, like, you know, which material is the best? That's a pretty open question, <laughs> yeah. I think. I've spent time on Thai hardtails. I rode the uh, Carbon Hanzo for several years up here in the Okanagan. I think really, you know, as far as designing the bikes go, most of the challenges that uh, we've had with different materials over the years of have all been overcome mostly from trial and error. Mm. And uh, so I, I think as far as like looking at it from a manufacturing point of view, we're pretty much capable to do anything with all of those four materials we talk about there. Mm. If you were to say, which is the best for a particular rider, I think that all depends on, you know, what they're looking for in the bike. You know, tie bikes are always cool because they're super durable. They don't scratch. Right. Carbon bikes are, are pretty neat because of the uh, opportunity to move material around and get a little bit more out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to put a little more uh, material down around the BB if that's the, the issue. But really for these bikes, because they're so burly by compared to like a cross country bike, they're all built relatively stiff mm -hmm. and compliancy, you know, I, I think one of the greatest things about mountain biking is the uh, continuous tinkering and evolution of all the components. So if you just look at tires, there's so many tire options out there. Like you can take any one of those bikes and depending on the tire you put on it, it, it alters the ride so much. Yeah. You know, and the suspension's a big part of it. You know, how the kind of suspension, how you set up your suspension, grips, saddle, so, yeah, I think, you know, materials, you know, you can make a good case for any one of the above, mm -hmm. but really at the end of the day, they're all really good nowadays. Interesting. Well, it, it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like you're saying that because designers and manufacturers have been working for these materials now for a while, that it's almost possible to get any sort of ride quality that you want out of any of these materials. Or put another way, you could design say a carbon bike to feel a bike frame to feel like a steel one is that the case 
that's pretty much, I think, an accurate statement. And in fact, I remember when uh, some years ago we did a lot of development with Easton building scandium bikes, mm -hmm. which is essentially just uh, aerospace grade aluminum. But that's what they did. They used to, you know, work on the aluminum tubes, the scandium tubes, mm -hmm. to get the same ride quality as a steel frame. So you're right in that respect. You can pretty much do anything with the materials. And there's, you know, so many, uh, so much opportunity to open up molds now. And, and it has been a real trial and error and a long process. But that's basically where we're at. You know, I think you could probably do it out of bamboo. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> if you wanted to. People are, aren't they? Yeah. Well, so one of the things I've noticed lately is that it seems like steel hardtails cost more than aluminum ones. And it feels like that's kind of flip-flopped, like back in maybe it was the 90s that aluminum was kind of a newer material. It was said to be lighter. And so back then, aluminum bikes cost more, but it seems like now uh, that's kind of flipped. Is is that the case? And, and why why would that have happened? Being a product manager, I'm always looking at costs of things and, and where materials are coming from and where frames are being built. But a lot of that is the raw material. What is steel going for? What is aluminum going for? Uh, probably mm. an even bigger driving factor with that. I mean, everything's so crazy with material costs these days, but um, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's economies of scale. It's just like there was, as you mentioned in the early days, this, the aluminum frames were more expensive. Um, and it's, I think it's just more of a thing like, there wasn't that many being built. It was just kind of mm. getting going. And then all of a sudden, all these bikes are being built out of aluminum. So you've just got all this aluminum being used and not as much steel and factories uh, changing their, well, not necessarily assembly line, but their manufacturing space. So now mm -hmm. we want to build 80%, you know, just as an example, 80% of our bikes are going to be built out of aluminum and, and only so many out of steel. Obviously when carbon came to be more of a thing than, than that changed again. But it's just that there's just fewer and fewer workers doing, uh, it, you know, not custom bikes, but mass production, fewer and fewer workstations, fewer and fewer people building quality steel frames versus aluminum frames. Yeah, I don't think steel frames have ever been cheap to build. You know, they've always been pretty expensive. That brings up a good point, economy of scale there and uh, and also the price of materials. So I, I think he, he's right. You know, you we do see a little bit of uh, shifting in product line depending on the cost to build the bikes. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, if you look, it seems nowadays there's always someone out there willing to pay for whatever exotic <laughs> material is available. Right. And a lot of the steel bikes, you know, those are being, in a lot of cases, they're like boutique bike brands too. So those are being built in smaller batches maybe they're being made uh in the u.s versus overseas and so that seems like could be part of what's driving the sort of average price of those types of bikes yeah the aluminum bikes are a little more you know you have to heat treat the frame and stuff so it's always been the case that smaller builders have found steel a little bit easier to work with mm -hmm. so that's maybe part of it i think the other really interesting point is you know, when we first started making bikes, how um, U.S. made bikes were coveted as being like sort of the top of the mark, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've built bikes all over America and all over the world. And, wow, when you go over to Asia and see what they have going on, it's a real mm -hmm. eye opener. I mean, uh, a point in case we have one factory that has their own foundry, their own extrusion plant. They make their own cloth for the carbon fiber. They make suspension. And it's pretty hard for a small frame maker to compete on that level. Mm -hmm. That said, you know, the, the good thing about being a small maker or a, a whatever you call that, a, you know, kind of a cottage bike maker is that mm -hmm. those guys are able to change up and custom make custom things. And that's got a lot of appeal also. Well, Doug, getting back to sort of what we were talking about uh, in terms of ride feel and ride quality, you know, a lot of what people are, are talking about really when they're talking about that is like compliance, like how, how well does the frame absorb the bumps in the trail? And you mentioned how things like tires and saddle make as much of a difference or maybe even more. 
on our bikes. But when we do talk about frame compliance, how much of that is due to the material that is used versus the design, like how the the angles are laid out and, and how the um, tubes are sized and shaped. It, which which one of those is is the bigger factor? Yeah, I think they all uh, contribute to the final outcome. But you're you're right. Uh, correct again. Like for me, I really enjoy riding steel bikes, and I know Kona. We've got a, a reputation over the years for having produced steel bikes for a long time. In fact, when when steel became a lot more expensive to build than the aluminum bikes, we stuck with the steel part of the program. Titanium, it's even more compliant than steel and maybe not the best material for certain applications. Mm. Like if you were looking at certain bikes, titanium makes a great frame for a lot of people. You know, it's it's the perfect bike. It has a lot of really great applications. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we've had the most success as far as uh, making a Hanzo, like an extreme bike out of titanium. Durability. Probably an aluminum-made bike's a little bit more durable than a steel bike. I've dented a few steel bikes. It's not that hard. But, you know, sort of getting back to more of the design aspect of it, it has a lot to do with the shape of the tubing. And you see now that, uh, you know, we invest a lot more money in custom-butted tubing, custom-shaped tubings just for that purpose. Mm. So it all becomes sort of a big part of the balance. Yeah. You know, you if you shorten it up and you make it a little thinner. But at the end of the day, I think really we're able to skirt a lot of the frame characteristics with component selection. Mm. You know, I, I think it's a bigger part of the, the end product. Pat may feel a little bit differently, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I think the geometry has more effect on the, uh, the uh, compliance of the ride than the tubing and the uh, just because they're built so bomb now, you know, they're. They're really overbuilt. Well, yeah, Pat, let's talk about component selection. So when you're specking a bike, do you look at the component selection differently for a hardtail versus a full suspension bike? And if so, like what are the key areas where those those builds are going to differ? It's a good question. I love this one. Yes and no. No, because, you know, when we spec out a bike as a product manager, we don't really look at it so much as... This is a hardtail. This is a full suspension bike. We're always looking at it as the application. So mm. when I say application, it's like, you know, like what discipline? Again, you know, cross country, downhill and everything in between, you know, light trail. We need a bike that's has the ability to, to ride some more aggressive stuff, but at the same time is going to climb great and be weight conscious. So, you know, a good example is like the uh, Process X and the Hanzo ESD. I mean, the Hanzo ESD is kind of like the hardtail version, even though it's steel, it's uh, hardtail, and there's some spec differences, but it's it's kind of the same application, but one's a hardtail, one's a full suspension bike, and it's that mm-hmm. this bike is going to go downhill, it's going to handle rough terrain, aggressive riding, hardcore, as you say. So mm-hmm. to answer your question more specifically, we don't spec there other than okay we don't put a rear shock on it there you go <laughs> <laughs> right so there's no rear shock but the component selection is 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 not because it's a hardtail versus full spit it's the application where is this bike going to be ridden what kind of riding is this this rider going to do so yeah i would i would say n- no mm. other than not specking a rear shock yeah so you're not saying well this is a hard tail so let's like put fatter tires on it you know to to make it ride a little more comfortably or yeah there is one other thing i did forget to mention though on that that it it does there is a difference in the spec and that's if there's something on the frame design like a, a seat tube size or something that drives the need to to change to change that component so if there's something mm-hmm. yeah that we need to we need to this frame will only accommodate such and such a spec where the full suspension version has to accommodate something different. So there, there's a good case of where we would spec different, but it's, it's not for that difference isn't for, you know, changing the rider or trying to make up some sort of deficit for it being a hardtail versus a full suspension bike. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Like dropper posts, you probably have straighter seat tubes on a lot of hardtails. And so you're able to do a, perhaps a longer, drop dropper post. I don't know if this is the case at Kona, but it seems like for a lot of brands too, the the spec, the component spec tops out more quickly on the hardtails than it does on full suspension. So you're seeing full suspension bikes with, you know, the the Kashima coated components and 
you know, the, the top of the line stuff, whereas the hardtails, a lot of times they kind of top out in that mid range. Is that have anything to do with the fact that it's a hardtail versus full suspension? Or is that more of just you're looking at the buyer and like a hardtail buyer is going to be more perhaps budget conscious than that full suspension buyer? Sadly, you are correct. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd like to say that there are people out there that would appreciate a really high spec built hardtail, the same that they would a full suspension bike. Generally, that's the case. It's just the, the price points top out. So we'll have a full suspension bike that goes up to $10,000 retail, whatever it is. And then we'll have a hardtail. It's like, well, how many people are buying $10,000 hardtails? It's not many. <laughs> right. So right. sometimes we do that. We, you know, we've, we've, we've definitely done some, some dream builds. I think some of the, like the carbon Hanzos, just some really well specced out, nice specced out, expensive hardtail. So it does happen, but not too often. Yeah. And I guess for people who really do want that, like you said, there's not a lot of them, but people who do can buy a frame and then build it up to their heart's desire. So I'm curious about hardtails and wheel sizes. It seems like that's another area where maybe there's a little different component spec where hardtails tend to, most of the ones we see are 29ers, whereas for full suspensions, a lot of brands are doing like 27.5 on smaller sizes uh, just to work with, you know, the suspension and everything that they need to fit in there and, and even mixed wheel. But again, 29ers tend to dominate for hardtails. Is that, is that the case? Is there a reason for that? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't like to use that. You know, you say a debate. I don't think it's really a debate. It's just, it's, it's again, that preference and there's going to be give and take. And to support what you said about the 29, I think the big thing that's driving the 29 inch wheel is the ability to roll over. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about that technical terrain and not having that rear suspension to soak that up with the 29 inch wheel. You're going to get a better rollover. You're going to get a, uh, a longer tire contact patch given the same tires and tire pressures. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I see, I see guys really liking 27, five and even 26. I mean, we just depends on the application, right? You know, we do sell shonky, frame sets still. And I see friends that really like the smaller wheel sizes just for the way that it handles, you know, coupled out with a, mm. you know, a certain geometry and that wheel size. And it, it, uh, it just, you get a different ride characteristic, you get a different feel, uh, maybe, you know, quicker handling with the smaller wheels. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't call it a debate, but to, uh, in the case, you know, the 29 inch wheel does roll over stuff more smoothly. So it's, it's a, a more popular size. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that you're able to do with the hardtails is sliding dropouts uh, for people who want to run single speed. And it looks like the Hanzo, at least one or two of the models uh, frames have those sliding dropouts. Is that an important selling point to people or is that more of a like, well, because we can, it just makes it a more versatile bike? Well, the main thing driving the sliding dropouts and why we put them on, I mean, there's there's obviously benefits. There's a, a few benefits to it, but the main reason is on the single speed bikes or the bikes that we're, you know, positioning to be built up as single speeds or, you know, in the case, like a bike, like the unit um, comes as a single speed. And that's to adjust that chain. It's quick, easy way to adjust that, that chain slack for, for a single speed. But mm -hmm. obviously it allows the, uh, the consumer to experiment with chain stay length. And, uh, you know, if they're going to use a bigger tire and they need a little bit more room, you've got that opportunity to slide those dropouts back, you know, and then if you want to go back to a smaller tire, and a little bit tighter rear triangle, that ability is there. Also, heaven forbid you crash hard enough to damage one of these dropouts. Uh, it's obviously easily replaceable, but they're, those are pretty robust. Mm -hmm. I would not want to, I think that would be probably the smallest of your issues, a crash that hard to break one of those, one of those, uh, <laughs> those modular dropouts. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, I mean, it's, it's kind of the, the flip chip of a hardtail is being able to slide the, the dropouts, change that chain stay length, customize it to your riding style and what you want to do, which is, which is a cool option. So one other product spec I'm curious about is uh, internal cable routing. And again, for whatever reason, it seems like a lot of hardtails, they don't, they don't do as much internal cable routing. Is is there a reason for that? Or is it like a budget thing? Or, or what's what's the thinking there? Oh, sadly, no, not sadly. I, I'll admit it. Mm -hmm. A number of us in the product group at Kona 
don't like internal cable routing um, for a number of reasons, but the the market does drive it. And, you know, obviously people within the company really do like the visual and just the tidiness of internal cable routing. I could probably speak for Doug and some of the other product guys is that it's just not something that feels good to punch holes in perfectly good <laughs> <laughs> frames to allow cables to go in there and it also makes it a pain in the ass to service them you know it, it's it's pretty obviously so you know my my personal thing on that is i really don't like internal cable routing but i do i do get the visual and just the tidiness of internal cables yeah interesting well this may be a question for doug but i'm curious about uh seat tube angles it seems like seat angles are getting steeper lately kind of across the board in mountain biking so how do you approach seat tube angles for hardtails compared to full suspension bikes do we need them as steep on a hardtail or uh or not yeah you know, the, one of the big reasons that, um, seat tube angles started getting so steep was, especially in suspension bikes, you know, we wanted to, uh, shorten up the rear chain stays, increase the travel and wheel path becomes an issue. You know, a lot of the reasons they get pushed forward is that they want to get the room in behind the, the seat post for the wheel to, to travel up and down. That's, that started driving it. But that said, when you look at the, Bikes like, again, the Hanzo, you know, where you're slackening out the front end, lengthening out the front end. It makes a lot of sense to have a, a steeper seat tube because when you climb, you're able to move your weight forward and get on top of that wheel a little bit more. And uh, that certainly is a benefit. Mm. And again, the same thing, you know, bigger tires, short chain stays, everything kind of has been pushing it forward. I don't think it's detrimental in any way. And, you know, again... If you look back at the early days of biking, there weren't a lot of components out there you were dealing with. Seat posts were probably 120 millimeters long. So nowadays, you know, you can get offset posts and, you know, the saddle's got a lot of adjustment. There's so many components. Really, riding demands or, you know, whatever is the most comfortable for the rider, there's so much opportunity to fine-tune your bike by adjusting the setup on it. Last thing I may be worth uh, that's kind of interesting is that, you know, you look at some of these numbers and they look really steep. But like you had mentioned earlier, you know, you see bent seat tubes trying to get the seat tube thrown out of the way a bit. And uh, if you look at a lot of geometries, they're giving you a seat tube angle. But the actual angle of the seat tube is different than the seat tube angle. Like some of them, I know on some of our geometry, we call it. STA seat tube actual and seat tube angle. Mm -hmm. What if it said, for example, 76 degrees, that might be 76 degrees if your saddle's exactly in, in line with the top of the head tube. Mm. But if you know, you look at a lot of bikes, people have their seat post up higher, that seat tube ends up slackening out a bit because the actual seat tubes may be, you know, 74 degrees. Mm. And um, the other thing that Pat and I had sort of talked about when we talk about bike design is that as well as it moving your weight forward and, and helping you with some um, climbing on these bikes, Pat says that, you know, he likes to have that steeper seat to descending because it kind of allows you to get your body out of the way of what's going on in the back end of the bike. Hmm. So interesting. I think people really can get hung up on geometry, but at the end of the day, you know, with component selection set up, and just riding style, people adapt. You know, it may mean that you just have a little bit more bend in your knee or a little bit more bend in your arm or a little bit shorter stem or a little bit higher stem, but uh, we all kind of work around it. Yeah, that's that's saying a lot, you know, saying that people get too hung up on geometry. And you're, you're a bike designer. I mean, if anybody's hung up on it, it would be you. And you're saying those numbers, they're interesting and, and they're important, but they're not the most important thing. Well, I think I know that, you know, we're going to maybe talk a little bit more about it. But, yeah, I think one of the things that's kind of interesting is back back when we first started putting front suspension on bikes, I think for a while there, we actually used to list the bike's geometry under SAG. Mm. And nowadays, the, the trend is to give people static geometry numbers. Mm -hmm. And um, it's... um. Certainly the case with hardtails, 
that if you know you depending on how you set the bike up i mean someone might go for 25 percent sag on the fork someone you know maybe 15 percent but that makes a big difference into bb height geometry front and back reach all those numbers like the numbers are really dynamic depending on setup of the bike right so a lot of times another thing that's interesting is i like to bring this up a lot of people think i get hung up on it but people really like to talk about reach and the one funny thing about reach is that it's referencing a floating point Hmm. it generally is taken from the bottom bracket to the top of the head tube now if you've got a relatively slack head tube angle and that head tube's 20 millimeters longer one size to the next that reference point has changed quite a bit you know you might you you might be looking at a front center that's lengthening out by an inch Mm -hmm. and your reach number looks like it's a quarter of an inch Hmm. so you know when you look at numbers like reach i think you sort of got to look at them sort of as a broad reference maybe like a model to model oh look this Hanzo is a half inch longer than the cross country bike. You can't really say to yourself, okay, I got to get this size bike. It's five millimeters longer than that bike. Right. And, uh, and I know that you had mentioned, uh, talking about the balance between reach here and, uh, and like rear center chain stay length. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I have seen reviews before where they talk about that. And specific brands that talk about balancing reach to chainstay length. Mm-hmm. But chainstay length, like for example, on a suspension bike, it's not a static number. So is that reach balanced to the chainstay at what amount of sag? At what point of travel? You know, it's, it's kind mm-hmm. of like, uh, nitpicking to the nth degree, in my opinion. <laughs> I don't want to take anything away from people that, you know, enjoy talking about that stuff. But, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I don't really understand that part of the the equation. Right. Well, yeah, we're the media. We have to talk about that stuff because otherwise we just say, hey, it's really cool. That's all we can say. It was a cool bike. It was good. So, yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. And I'm curious to know, too, like, you know, it seems like with full suspension bikes these days, especially there's so many constraints to like what you can do because you got to have the shock placement and oh by the way now everybody wants at least one water bottle that's going to fit in the the front triangle so are you able to do more or have more freedom uh to do different things with geometry on a hardtail because it is has fewer constraints in terms of your design and specifically I'm thinking about like what extreme sort of things have you tried or could you do with a hardtail that maybe you couldn't do with a full suspension in terms of the geometry? Wow. That's, that's quite a question. Obviously there's fewer constraints, but um, the challenge certainly as far as putting the bike together is people always want a narrower Q factor, a bigger back tire, a shorter chainstay. No one ever comes to the table with a, a worksheet that's like, oh, open it up, make it longer, something that's easier to do. So you're always trying to uh, fit as much as you can into the smallest possible space, you know. But uh, uh, I don't, I don't really think there's a huge differentiation between one and the other. Obviously, the shock is a problem with a dual suspension bike. You don't have to deal with that with a hardtail, but mm-hmm. the challenges are always seem to be the same. And it, like I said, I think you know through manufacturing and materials and stuff, there's just so much potential to do so much more now than there used to be back in the old days. Okay. I can't really think of anything about uh, as far as when it comes to putting a hardtail together that really is uh, super challenging. And, you know, I think you make a lot of good points there. As a design team, a group of guys, you know, certainly now you're, you know, we have a a uh, larger product group a lot more engineers and stuff doing the job but on top of that you know when you're a when we're a smaller company or really sort of north shore bellingham focused things were pretty easy as the company gets bigger and you have more and more customers around the world everyone's got input and everyone's looking for something a little different and that starts become challenging you know how many people are you going to make happy and Oh yeah. And that's a, that's the hardest part of the job, trying to appeal to a lot of people. Well, yeah, Pat, I want to get back to you and 
talk about like what does the typical hardtail rider look like? We talked about how cost is a factor when you're thinking about hardtails, uh, keeping it under a certain price point, and also just the cool factor. Some people like hardtails because it it says something about them or their riding style. What? Who do you? What does the the typical hardtail rider look like to you? Who do you imagine when you're putting one of these together? Yeah, again, it's that, uh, you know, if you're just trying to be objective about it, you go, yeah, cost. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Well, I can't afford a full suspension bike. I want to go mountain biking and get that experience. Um, and hardtails, given the same spec and materials, are cost less. Um, but, uh, you know, I wish that wasn't the case. Um, but to touch on what makes a hardtail rider or, or why are people drawn to hardtails, Less complicated for sure. Uh, as I mentioned before, like that, that it's just, you feel more in touch with what you're doing. What was I thinking of earlier here? Oh, for one thing, like when you're riding a hardtail or at least when I'm riding a hardtail versus a full suspension bike, you kind of go into it or you're, you're at least rudely awakened that you can't go through the same section of trail as quickly as you could on rough trail as quickly as you could on a full suspension bike that has a lot of bumps and roots and rocks and steepness to it. But what it does do, at least to me, is it kind of keeps me in check. Okay, so maybe I can't go as fast through this section. Maybe I need to spend more time putting more uh, effort into how I how I uh, manage to get the bike through a section. Different line selection, for sure. You start looking at smoother lines, lines where you can, um, you know, just transition easier, you know, hit a smooth section, bounce over across a technical section where normally on a full suspension bike, you would just plow through it. So I would say that that should be thought of as well, as far as defining a hard, uh, uh, someone who really wants to ride hardtails is that they're looking for that connectivity with, with the uh, ride experience and how it differs. You have to be more cognizant about what you're doing and how you're riding it and where you're riding. Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, maybe a similar example is like flip phones and smartphones, right? Like flip phones, everybody had one. And then the smartphone came out and it was like, you know, added a bunch of features and like everybody buys smartphones now, but the hardtail has stuck around, like despite all these advances in full suspension bikes. And there's still a lot of people, they're not just trying to be weird. They're not that weird guy that has the flip phone that's trying to be ironic. Like a lot of people, they choose a hardtail because they either like how it rides or like you said, it's lower maintenance or easier to to maintain or, you know, it's cheaper. I mean, there's so many reasons that people choose hardtails and it's awesome to see that that's still an option for people and that, that, you know, brands like Kona are pushing the envelope and, and seeing progressive geometry um, in hardtails as well as the, you know, more uh, feature rich full suspension bikes. Yeah. There's a lot of truth to that. You know, I, I moved out of uh, Vancouver up to the interior of BC about seven years ago now. And I have a lot of really smooth, sandy, pine needle-like single track up here. Mm -hmm. And I can do a lot of, you know, epic 100-mile rides, 80-mile rides up here on smooth single track. And the hardtail was a, is a really great bike to ride on. Mm -hmm. You don't really have to have suspension for a lot of the, uh, the rides we do up here, mm -hmm. which is nice. And, you know, if you don't need the suspension, boy, what a treat to get on a bike that's that much lighter and that much, uh, easier to climb on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I think Pat really nailed it too. You know, a lot like cross training, when you ride bikes, you find a lot of people that now they gravel ride, they got a dual suspension bike, they single speed, they have a hardtail. And <clears throat> when you spend more time on all those bikes, it seems to make all your disciplines, you know, better. You're, you, you become better at riding a dual suspension bike if you spend some time on your hardtail. Yeah. So, yeah, it sounds like, Doug, you're still riding your hardtail. What about you, Pat? You you have a hardtail and, and how much do you ride it if you have one? Absolutely. I probably, I was just thinking about that. Actually, of, of the mountain bikes I have in my stable, they're kind of rotating in and out because we're obviously always testing components and developing frames and whatnot. But my go-to is a unit X of all things. It's, 
it's basically the frame set because we've, I've had to change the components on it so much because I'm testing different drive trains and brakes and wheels. But um, the thing I really love about that unit X is, or just a unit frame is uh, its versatility. It's really even more than a dual sport. It's a, <laughs> it's a 10 times sport because you can do so many different things with it. You know, I can road ride with it. Um, I can mountain bike as you would a hardtail. I can put a full suspension fork on it. Um, I can ride it as a single speed and it's just kind of always there and it's a comfortable bike to ride. And, you know, I can, I can change out wheels and tires and it can accept all those things. So really the reason I like that unit is just the versatility. So I've got a question for you, Dr. Dew. If you were able to design a bike that you didn't have to worry about whether anybody would buy it or anything, and it was a hardtail, what would you do? What would be the like thing that you want to try or the thing that would be like just for you uh, that would make a, a really cool bike? Well, not to say that we haven't made bikes before in the past that have had no commercial appeal. Yes, I would definitely have a, I would make a hardtail. And personally, I think I would pick steel as my number one choice. And, uh, I, I think, you know, the Hanzo ESD is probably a bit more bike than my riding style. You know, I'm, I'm not a young buckaroo. I don't do tabletops and tail whips. But certainly, uh, it would probably fall right into the Hanzo category. Mm. I would go for adjustable dropouts, not uh, necessarily because I wanted to run it as a single speed, but I, I like to have the option of uh, the adjustable chain stay length. And again, for my style of riding, I'd, I wouldn't push them back all the way, but I would probably be sitting somewhere in the middle. Like I, I like a 425-ish something in that neighborhood for my, my kind of riding. Yeah. I would have water bottle mounts on it. Although I'm, uh, you know, more likely to have a camelback on my, uh, my body because I like to carry tools and, mm -hmm. and food and a, a little saw with me when I ride. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, that says a lot. It says a lot that you have kind of the, the leeway and the freedom to, to build the bikes that you want, uh, at Kona and also the, the Hanzo. I mean, again, like that's a bike that anytime this conversation about aggressive, hard, hardcore, whatever you want to call them, hardtails comes up, people bring up the Hanzo as like, that's kind of the, that's the standard. And so, yeah, it seems like you, you really nailed it there. And there's not a lot necessarily that, that would need to be changed or that you would want to change. So that's, that's really cool. Well, Pat, I want to uh, ask one final question uh, for folks who have hardtails, um, who ride them regularly, or folks who are considering them now to buy one going from full suspension. Are there things that you recommend people might want to do in terms of modifying their riding style? Or um, are there settings for things like tires and forks uh, that maybe are a little different for uh, hardtails? Or is it is it pretty similar to a regular full suspension bike? Good question. I, I, I'm going to go back and relate again to experience. And uh, the first thing that comes to mind, because I do have many friends who, you know, started out on full suspension bikes or that became their main mountain bike. And then they wanted a hardtail either for pump track riding or just looking for that alternative feeling, you know, skiing versus snowboarding, just a different, different way of riding. And, you know, also just the, the hardtail is going to climb better or if they're going to go down a well, like a rails to trails thing. But the first thing that I see is that they have a really expensive full suspension bike. They buy a hardtail and what do they do? They take care of the full suspension bike, keep it in the garage, keep it cleaned, keep it maintained. And the hardtail goes out in the shed, <laughs> something that I affect and gets a rusty chain. So my first thing is take care of it. It's still a bicycle. It's still a machine. <laughs> Not indestructible. If you love it, it will love you. So take care of your, yeah, take care of your hardtail. It's not indestructible. I think as far as modifying your riding style, I pretty much touched on that. You just need to realize that, uh, um, you're not going to be able to bash through technical steep terrain, terrain the same way you would with a full suspension bike that is of the same application. So mm -hmm. pick your lines, um, enjoy that, enjoy that challenge that it brings being, you know, more careful or more 
cognizant of where you're going with it and, and how to negotiate that terrain. Things like tire pressure and fork spring rates, that is, I don't know that I would tell someone to change anything because when you make changes in tire pressure, let, let's say that you think that you're going to get, you want a little bit more compliance. So you're going to reduce the tire pressure and you're going to reduce that tire pressure more than what you would in your full suspension bike. Mm-hmm. So by doing that, you're not going to get as bad as, you're not going to get as good a performance out of that tire. If you lower the pressure too much, it's going to start rolling over and, and not gripping and not being predictable. And you're also going to, you know, possibly damage your rim, your wheel. Mm-hmm. Fork pressure, same thing. If you start, Messing with that, I mean, you start changing the way a bike will behave. You know, when you hit the brakes hard and go into a corner, and if you've got a different spring rate than what you do on your other bike, then it's going to, you know, it's going to have negative impact on how the bike handles in those situations. So I wouldn't try and mess with things like tire pressure and, and fork spring rate to accommodate going from a full suspension to a hardtail. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good that it's, it's not that different for a lot of people and that what we learn and what we enjoy about uh, any bike is transferable. Well, thank you both so much for taking the time to talk. I learned a ton about hardtails and I'm more stoked to ride them than ever before. And I think our listeners are as well. So thank you both. Thank you for having us. That was fun. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. That was fun. All right. Well, that's all we've got this week. We'll talk to you again next week. Bye.